right. Joining us right now is Garson Kane, and he has uh, published a novel which is getting, getting a, a tremendous amount of advance acclaim. It's a novel about the movie business, and it's probably looking like a little bit like a mirror when we hold up here. It's called Moviola. Let me tell you a little bit about Garson Kane. Uh, he wrote, uh, these are just some of his credits. He's lots of different talents here. He was a stage director of Funny Girl in the Diary of Anne Frank. He wrote the play. Born Yesterday, was the author of books, uh, uh, the book on Tracy and, and Hepburn, Remembering Mr. Mom, and A Thousand Summers, also wrote One Hell of an Actor, which is a book. As a director, he directed A Man to Remember, Bachelor Mother, My Favorite Wife, Tom, Dick, and Harry. As a screenwriter, remember the great films Adam's Rib, Pat and Mike, A Double Life, The Marrying Kind, all come out of this man's head. <laughs> Let's have a nice welcome for Garson Kane. And now you've got this big scoop of whipped cream with a maraschino cherry on the top, which is moviola. Yeah, Bill. Tell us about yeah, it. Well, it's, 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 it's the book of my life. Uh, uh, Art was just telling us about his long life and how it began. Uh, you never got a high school diploma, Art? I got one, but. Did uh, you? Yeah. yeah. That's more than I did. I never got did a high school one? diploma. I made no. mine, <laughs> <laughs> I made it in shop. <laughs> The only guy with a wooden diploma, right? Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I, uh, I spent my life in and among the movies, as we say. When I was six years old, my father owned and operated a movie theater in Rochester, New York, where I was born. It was called the Panama. And uh, someone might say, why was it called the Panama? Well, it stood beside one of the little offshoots of the Erie Canal. So there was a tiny canal and the movie house stood on the banks of the canal so it was called the Panama. I was six years old. Now I don't remember any of this but my family tells me that I haunted that movie house and I used to hang around the projection room and the projectionists were very kind to me. They let me stand up on a stool and, and, and watch. Uh, some of the pictures were kind of dirty <laughs> which explains my present personality. <laughs> but anyway they tell me that I was so impatient to see the movies that sometimes I wouldn't wait and I would get to the theater in the morning and go up in the booth and open the cans of film and look at the film frame by frame by frame by frame so that by the time the projections got there the film was all over the floor and they used to kick my butt out of there. But I fell in love with the movies as many of us have. And I'm still in love with the movies. And eventually, at a very advanced age, I wrote this book. Now, I, I got some specific things I want to know about the book. There's a 92-year-old man in the book named B.J. Farber. He is um, a great part for Art Carney, not, not by bad. the way. Huh? I'm signed up. I'm uh, going to do it. Huh? You're going to do a movie? I hope so. <laughs> it would be a good part for Art Carney, as a matter of fact. At <laughs> any rate, he is about, he's considering, he's in New York, he's considering selling this enormous life's work, this movie studio, right, to a big conglomerate. And he reviews, he goes back through all of his long career and all the people he was involved with. Now, here's what I want to know. Are these true stories? All the stories are true. All the, this is a great, it's a great premise. They're so you got a fictional. True. Art is about roughly my age, a little bit younger, but Art certainly remembers the Fatty Arbuckle scandal. Yep. Yep. Art remembers the search for Scarlett O'Hara. He remembers uh, the great Garbo Gilbert romance. He remembers the discovery of Marilyn Monroe. The stories themselves, of course, are absolutely true. What is not true, but it's truer than true, is the fictional character Ben Farber, who is a amalgam of Sam Goldwyn, Adol Zukor, Carl Lemley, Harry Warner, Jack Warner, L.B. Mayer, Louis B. Mayer, all, all of the great tycoons, the great pioneers, the founding fathers of the movie business. Now remember, Bill, that, that when Sam Goldwyn went into the movie business, there was no movie business. He started, he was the there movie was no business. There was no business. There were just some guys who had bed sheets and projectors and a sign that said, moving pictures, five cents. And they went around and they, they would find a dry goods store or a gym or a church 
and they would put up the bed sheet and the projector and the sign. People would pay a nickel and they'd go in and by golly, there were pictures that moved. Well, see, you kids don't remember that. You, you, <laughs> you, you've been brought up on television and movies. You don't remember a time when there was no such thing as a motion picture. But when I knew Samuel Golden, I worked for Samuel Golden, he lived to be 92 years old and was still in the business, and he was one of the guys who was in the business when it started. Uh, and that's what the book is about. You talk about things starting in the book. For example, the, and I'd like it if you can, tell the story of the creation of the Charlie Chaplin yeah. character, Little yeah. Tram. This is, some, this is a universal character known the world over. In the book, you, we, you take us to the, the time when Chaplin created that character. So okay. Tell us about that. Now, uh, uh, it'll be boring for Art because he knows more about this than I do, but the fact is... No, Art's got the radio in his ear. Nothing's boring <laughs> for him. He's okay. <laughs> Not going to be boring for me. The I... fact is that there was a, a, an act in the music halls and vaudeville theaters called A Night in an English Music Hall. And in that act, there was a young comedian. He was 23 years old, and his name was Charles Chaplin. So, Mabel Norman, who was a marvelous uh, silent film comedian, and Max Sennett, known as the King of Comedy, uh, they went to New York and they saw this act. Mabel Norman spotted this kid, and she said to Max, that guy is great. So he signed him for $150 a week. What kind of act was Chaplin doing? It was, was a big extravaganza of a sight comedy and English music hall songs and dances and sight gags falling on their face, pie in the face and so on. Now, Charlie Chaplin went out to California. He was 24 years old and he was getting $150 a week from Max Sennett. And the other people who were working there were Fatty Arbuckle, Buster Keaton. Laurel and Hardy then? Uh, Laurel and Hardy, Ford Sterling, uh, Larry Seaman, yeah. uh, Harry Langdon, and Max Sennett thought they were all great, but he said to Charlie Chaplin, listen, I gotta let you go, you're not funny. You're a good kid, I like <laughs> you, you're not funny. See, there are no experts in yeah, this business. That's, what I, that's the <laughs> whole point of the yeah. story. He said, you're not funny. The point is that Max Sennett was a marvelous man, I knew him. But he was kind of a vulgarian. Did you ever know him, Mark? Did no, you ever run no, into him? No. Well, he, he was very clever, but he was a, a vulgarian. He thought the only things that were funny were a pie in the face or a fall on the keister. He had no sense of the nuance, no sense of a little elegance in comedy, the kind of marvelous elegance that Art Carney has always had. The <laughs> great, great elegance, you know, no matter no matter what art does, it has a touch of elegance. And true about Jackie, too. There's no more no elegant comedian it. than Jackie. It's but really true. Isn't it true? It is. But, but Mac Sennett didn't understand that, and he always wanted to fire Chaplin. Now, he was on the verge of canning him when one day Chaplin walked into the dressing room despondent. And he said to the other fellows who were dressing with him, this yeah. is what you mean, isn't it, Bill? Uh, yeah, this uh, is the point. Arbuckle and, and Keaton and Ford Sterling and all the rest. And he was so unhappy, he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to get canned. And, uh, I got a bit to do in this picture. And he looked down, and, and there were a pair of pants owned by Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who weighed 324 pounds. And Chaplin said, you mind if I put those on, Fatty? And he said, no, put them on. So he put on these oversized pants, and then he saw some shoes, and he said, I, I think I'll put on those funny shoes, and they didn't fit. So Buster said, why don't you put the left on the right and the right on the left? And he did. And then he saw a derby, and he put that on, and he was wearing a mustache with points, and he cut the points off, and that gave him another mustache. And then he put on a frock coat, and they all started to giggle, because he was ridiculous, and he started to walk, and because of the imbalance of the shoes, he began to walk, kind of funny. <laughs> And to go around the corner, he had to go around on one foot. And he picked up a cane all of a sudden. And Max Sennett constantly was saying, he ain't funny. He ain't funny. Now, Chaplin waddled onto the set in this crazy makeup and burby and, and mustache and cane. And he waddled around and he walked on the set and everybody bust out laughing, including Max Sennett. And as he did so, he said to Mabel Norman, who's that? 
<laughs> and Mabel said, Charlie Chaplin. And he stopped laughing and he said, he ain't funny. <laughs> <laughs> what a story. That's yeah. a wonderful story. That's great. This uh, gives you a little bit of an insight into, I, I think that the, the, the way you've constructed this novel is terrific, to go back into real things like that. We're going to take a break for a commercial. When we come back, Art Carney will not be here. Thank you very much and good luck okay. with going in style. Garson Payne and we'll be here. We'll be right back.